so today I uh, I'm going to go a little bit easy on you because of your exam this morning. I hope that uh, most of you have done it well, and I think Marcelo will tell you the results at some stage. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm going to try to to tell you about uh, something that I find extremely interesting and beautiful. So I hope it. Uh, elevates your spirits even if you didn't do that well in the, in the morning exam. Uh, so we are continuing with, uh, uh, with entitlement, but, uh, but it's going to be interesting how multidisciplinary the whole thing will get now, in the sense that um, we will have information theory combined with quantum mechanics, but we'll also engage a little bit of thermodynamics and functional analysis, which I just started to talk about on Friday, but we didn't get a we didn't, get, we didn't really get a chance to explore this direction. So let me, let me mention the last thing that I, that I talked about really um, on, uh, on Friday. There was an issue where I said that when you have a pure bipartite state, you can claim it with certain degree of confidence that there is a unique way of talking about entanglement. Um, and uh, we looked at the case of two, two, two level systems, but you can extend this to any number of systems. And I'll, I just want to tidy up a few of these things that we can talk about. So if you remember correctly, what we did is we started with a state uh, like A00 plus B11, or any, any related state. And then, and then we said, if you have a single copy, you can do something with that to convert it into a maximally entangled state. If you have two copies, you can do a bit more. This is now a direct analogy with, with a single bit or qubit communication where if you send more than one bit, then you can do better per bit than, than if you send only one message and you never communicate again. The same goes for any other protocol. Discriminating states is much easier if you are given um, multiple copies of these states. It's exactly the same story here. So for you to get a unique measure, you really should look at the thermodynamical limit. And in the same sense, entropy becomes a unique measure in Shannon's theory, which is why the logs come out uh, in, in another way, if you like. If, if, if you don't do that, then it's very difficult to talk about. There are many different measures that will capture this. So what we really looked at is we said, suppose I've got n. So this sign here just saves me writing this state n times. And this says Alice and Bob share these copies. And now what I claim is that they can make a local operation. Uh, in, in, in fact, Alice uh, is sufficient that Alice uh, does a local operation. Um, and the local operation was effectively a projective measurement onto the, what we call the typical subspace on Alice's side. So the typical subspace is the one where zeros and ones occur with an equal, with an equal, um, uh, with, a, with a probability of a squared and b squared in the long run, if you like. So basically what Alice sees is a state A0, this for Alice. If you trace Bob out, you get a squared 0, b squared 1, n times. And now she will have all possible sequences when you expand this. There will be two to the n terms, and there will be a term with all zeros. There will be n terms with 1, 1, and n minus 1 zeros, and so on, like, like the binomial distribution. And the one that's going to be typical is the sequence which contains, um, which contains a squared zeros uh, times n, I suppose, and contains b squared times n ones. That's the, those sequences are the ones for which the probability will tend to, now I'm being super pedantic, the probability will tend to unity when n tends to infinity. So ultimately, even though I'm saying you're making a projective measurement and it sounds as though you could have a mistake and you are not successful in your projection, in the limit this, this effectively becomes a unitary transformation. It's with certainty that you will get this outcome when you send n to infinity. Alice does this, and then she's within a subspace where she's got 2 to the n times the entropy of this guy, minus a squared log a squared minus b, always the same story. Okay? 
there's only one formula in information theory always. You know, just to paraphrase that there is only one mystery in quantum mechanics. You always get the same formula. So this guy now tells you the size of the projective space, the number of strings that Alice will get. For each of those strings, there is a string on the other side for Bob. You can imagine, if you like, if it's easier for you that Bob also makes a projective measurement. And because they are fully entangled, for every sequence of zeros and ones in this subspace, Bob has a corresponding one. So you can, already, you can already see how entangled they are, because that's the number of states they have. And mathematics tells us that each of them occurs with the same probability. They are all uniformly distributed in this subspace. Hence, what we claimed is that you can convert these guys into a certain number of maximally entangled pairs. Okay, here is a maximally entangled state, if you like. <coughs> M. And the ratio of M and M is, in fact, the entropy itself. That's, that's another way of stating what I wrote down there. So if you look at this state, the subspace, the typical subspace on, of, on Alice's side correlated to the one on Bob's, you will see that you can expand it in this way. I don't know if this pen is good for you or not, but that's basically, uh, that's it. And now, uh, a good way of writing this is that the limit, when n tends to infinity, so if you really want to be precise, the limit of this ratio is equal to, the, to this entropy there, the reduced entropy. Okay? And this is the so-called entanglement of distillation. So by only doing local operations, I've converted n copies of a non-maximally entangled state into a fewer number of maximally entangled states. And that number <coughs> itself is the amount of entanglement. Um, so that's a really nice, uh, that's a really nice way of, uh, of looking at entanglement. And what I said before is that um, it was a pity, actually, that you cannot apply this for general mixed states now. If you say, why don't you start with some, some uh, mixed state here, then you could, but, but then we don't have anything as nice and concrete as, as what I just told you. So one thing I want to tidy up before I launch into something that I said was very beautiful, and I will, I will tell you what this is. And I think this started to become clear sometime in 96, I think, 97. Uh, people, people realize that actually the way we understand entanglement is very similar to the way we understand uh, adiabatic processes in thermodynamics. And once you understand thermodynamics well, you can map it one to one to draw some very general conclusions about entanglement without having to do any calculation. And of course, we physicists love this kind of stuff. So, you know, Dirac is very famous for saying you only understand um, an equation or a situation well when you can actually write down the solution without solving the equation itself. And all of us physicists uh, strive towards that. Can I really use my intuition and can I think about it? And I don't want to do the brainless calculation and really anticipate the behavior of my solution without solving it exactly. And you'll see how far we can get with this kind of logic. It's really very interesting. Um, so what I said is you can do this for any dimensional system. And, and, the, and the statement is interesting because, um, because of the following. If you imagine that you have, um, so the statement goes like this. Any state of, um, of, of two subsystems of some size, and, and M or whatever you like the sizes to be, can be written as, uh, as, um, as a combination of these types, okay? So I don't know how to call these guys. Let's call them uh, A, N, and B, N. So I have an orthogonal basis for Alice, an orthogonal basis for Bob, uh, and this goes you know, for, from 1 to whatever number you need it to go to, some kind of dimensionality. So what's interesting is that any state of, of two subsystems can be written in this. And this is this famous Schmidt decomposition. So, um, this guy, um, this guy was a pure mathematician, and this result comes from 1907. Uh, this is 20 years before any quantum mechanics, uh, and of course he couldn't care less about physics. He worked in in uh, some kind of functional theory, and he was trying to decompose functions in this way without any 
without any application to anything in physics. But it turned out interestingly that some time later, people used it quite extensively. So the logic is that even though uh, if I give you a basis uh, for two subsystems, you would think that I have to have all possible combination of the basis states. So, uh, so for example, you know, if I have a basis, orthogonal basis ui for one subsystem and vj for another subsystem, then you would say the most general state of this system is simply a linear combination of all of these guys. So I would have something like ij, some coefficient dij, ui tensor product dj. And note the double index here. I don't have it here. I've got a single index. This index is excellent to notice correlations. I measure A1. On analysis side, I know I have B1 on the other. This is really written for the purpose of understanding entanglement. Um, and is it obvious that any state of this type can be written as a state of that type? It's not obvious immediately. Um, again, in, in this formulation, it's not clear how correlated they are, because for one index of, uh, of Alice, you've got all the different index on both sides. So, so it's not clear to, to see even whether, this me, uh, whether these guys are symmetric as far as entanglement is concerned. But we know that they have to be symmetric. So you know, some, some common index has to be found from, from the way we understand correlations now. So how do we do that? And a nice way of seeing this is to trace, start with the most general state that you claim, and trace either Alice or Bob out. Doesn't matter which one. Trace Bob and get the density matrix of Alice. That's some density matrix. Now, write this density matrix in its eigen decomposition. In general, again, it could be very difficult. If I give you a six-dimensional or five-dimensional system, what this means is that you have to diagonalize a five-by-five five matrix. And we can't do that analytically. But we know in principle you can somehow solve this thing. So imagine that I solved it, and imagine that I have some kind of, uh, as usual, we would write it something like Ri, and then some basis R. A I. So these are just the eigenvalues, and these are the eigenvalues of your of your density matrix. You can always do that. And now I use the, the same logic that I used for the church of higher Hilbert space. I actually call these guys R's, I call them A's. And I call this C coefficient the square root of this R. This R is like a probability, but here this is an amplitude. So if I if I was to write if I if I was to use these guys as the as these states and I did the same for Bob, um, R B would be uh, would be R I R B I whatever R B I, and if I correlate them, then R one of A always goes with R one of B and so on. You can see that I've reproduced both of the both of the reductions, and at the same time, I can match these coefficients here. So I'm giving you like a sketch of the proof. So in fact, what I'm really going to do is I'm going to write my state down as square root of Ri, Ria, Rib. If I trace the system A out, because these states are orthogonal, I'm going to get a mixture that I claim I have here. If I chase this guy out, I'm going to get the mixture that I have here. So you can see that I'm talking about exactly the same state as the initial one that I started with. But I've rotated it now. How did I rotate it? By diagonalizing the reduced density matrices. So the diagonalization is the unitary transformation, if you like, that you need to apply here and here so that the state starts to look like that. So these two states are one and the same state. They're just decomposed in a completely different way. And that's beautiful now, because I can tell you immediately the amount of entanglement in any state of two subsystems. So the entanglement, of course, would just be equal to, by the same logic, minus mod c n squared log mod c n squared. So once you've written it, or this, you can use ri if you like, instead of the square. It's the same 
part n part n. So once you once you basically found the diagonal decomposition, found the Schmidt decomposition, you've got immediately the amount of entanglement. And not only that, but you can show that starting with a state like that, and n copies, you can get n, n times the this measure here, maximally entangled states. Maximally entangled is the one where, where each of these, so each of these guys occurs. So max, max entanglement is the one where each of these occurs with one over root d amplitude, if you like. So each, each orthogonal state is mixed with an equal, with an equal weight, if you like. So now we can understand pure bipartite states and we can talk about the amount of entanglement. And, and this is where the story ends in the sense of being a nice story. The rest of the results that we're going to present in some sense are not going to be as nice and clean. Um, but of course, uh, the justification for proceeding now is that this, what we've analyzed so far, is a highly idealized case. So, you really never ever prepare a pure state of this type uh, in the lab. Even if you have two trapped ions, there will be a one in a thousand probability that you didn't get this right state. And even though it's small, it, me it immediately means that you're dealing with a mixed state. So you have to do something, uh, something about it. But before I, before I go into that, which I think it will happen actually, uh, during the second part, I want to start talking a little bit about the analogies in thermodynamics because quite a lot of these results you can actually show without without doing the calculations that I've that I've been doing in some sense. Um, so let me let me let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, it's a very beautiful topic, and it's a little bit mysterious uh, why this is so. Um, um, one of the editors of Scientific American uh, has been trying to write a popular article about this and um, we've talked quite a lot about it and I think at some stage he just gave up and asked me to do it myself because I think it's a very intricate topic and I think you can ask many deep questions there. You know, are, are these really just analogies with thermodynamics? Is it an accident that the information entropy is the same as the thermodynamical entropy? the same as the amount of entanglement, or is there something deeper behind this? I mean, does it mean that really I can derive thermodynamics from quantum mechanics or vice versa, or which one is, you know, can I take one of them to be more fundamental in some sense? So now, here is what's interesting. I'd like you now to think about uh, this protocol, which is known as distillation of entanglement because you distill pure states. I'd like to think of it as a kind of cycle in some sense, in thermodynamics. So I'll remind you a little bit of that. So Carnot says, um, uh, Carnot was the guy who, who discovered the second law of thermodynamics, and that's the analogy we're going to be pushing now, because the entropy is the key quantity in the second law, and here the entropy quantifies the amount of entanglement, interestingly. So, so, so Carnot, uh, this came incidentally before the first law, uh, of thermodynamics. So kind of realize that there are certain things that you just cannot do uh, in nature. And, and he captured it in this way. He said, um, he said very modestly, uh, no, no cycle in nature which is trying to extract work by absorbing heat can be more efficient than my cycle. This cycle is called Carnot's. I mean, that's what Carnot said, not my cycle, myself. So basically, we phrase it by saying that the Carnot uh, engine is the most efficient engine. And that's equivalent to any other formulation of the second law, like you cannot, um, you cannot move um, heat uh, from a cold to a hot system without investing work. So, in other words, you have to pay your electricity bill if you have a fridge in your house. You can't have a fridge for free. Uh, that's equivalent to the Carnot statement. Um, and the other statement, which is due to Kelvin, is basically saying you can't convert all the heat into work. There has to be something inefficient. So all of these are the same. I'm just reminding you a little bit of thermodynamics. So basically, the way that um, 
the way that you show that this is correct is now something I'm going to use to show you um, that this has got to be the efficiency of, of the distillation of entanglement. I'm going to use analogies now. And it's going to be interesting. So, so what did Carnot say? Carnot said, I think, again, this is all reminding you, just to show you the analogy and to, and to try to map it. And then I'll show you one very interesting consequence of that. To me, this is very interesting, really. Uh, because, because it gives you a one-line proof of something that otherwise would be probably much more complicated. So here is this hot reservoir, if you like. Here is this cold reservoir. And Carnot has some kind of cycle. This is a typical, you know, undergraduate thermodynamics textbook. You open a random one, you will get a picture like that. And, and what this guy is trying to do is, is trying to get some heat, uh, heat input. Uh, it's trying to do the work. But Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, from his castle in Scotland, smoking cigars and drinking single malt whiskies, <laughs> says that you cannot not have something going to the lower reservoir. You have to have some waste, whatever you do. This is this famous depressing uh, consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and the efficiency, Carnot says, here is my efficiency. And my efficiency is basically the work divided by the heat input how much heat I have to draw so that I can do a certain number of work. And, and, and basically, from what I said now, you know that this efficiency cannot exceed 1. Because that would imply that there is no heat output here. That would be immediate violation of the second one. So how do you prove that there is nothing more efficient than the Carnot cycle? Well, you suppose that there is. Okay? So you say, let me assume the famous method already invented by the ancient Greek, Greeks, the reduction to an absurd in, in some sense. So let's suppose that you can, and then I'm going to arrive at something contradictory. Uh, and so you suppose that you have another cycle like that, operating between the same two temperatures. And uh, what you have is you draw Q1, or let's say prime here, you do some work prime here, you get some Q2 prime out, output. And what you want to claim is that this prime efficiency, which in this case is W prime over Q1 prime, is going to be larger than eta, contradicting Carnot. Carnot says, I've got an engine. It's the best you can do. And you say, no, look, my car does much better than that. Okay, I can accelerate much faster than you can in 100 meters. Okay. So, uh, so what's the problem with that? The problem is that these guys are fully reversible. And in fact, the word reversible is going to be applicable directly to, to here as well. I will be able to start from this state and go backwards by local operations. That's going to be the analogy that I'm going to deploy. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a fridge in some sense. Okay? I'm going to convert convert um, this guy basically backwards, each of these arrows. But what I need for that is I need, I need, uh, I need, some, kind of, uh, I need some kind of work input. So I'm just reversing the Carnot engine into a Carnot fridge, if you like. Again, I'm reminding you of the standard proof of that. So what I'm going to do now is couple the two engines. This work output is going to feed into this. And the total effect is to have certain quantity of heat moved from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir up without anything extra happening. And this is impossible. Clausius says no. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So that's how you prove that these two statements are the same. Um, if you could violate Carnot's statement and be better than what Carnot says, then you could also transfer heat from a cold to a hot body without any other effect. And we know, like I said, you cannot do that. You cannot have a fridge that doesn't cost you any money. So now, what on earth is the analogy between these two? The analogy is that the entropy tells you really how efficient you are here in the same way that the entropy tells us how efficient we are over there. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to just show you now how this, how this works. So in direct analysis, so the question now you ask yourself is what am I going to take as the second law of thermodynamics 
in, in my case. And the second law, uh, let's call it, I don't know how to call it actually, there is no uh, uh, second law of entanglement, okay? There is no first law, but uh, it's just the way it is. Um, it's the third law, that there is no first law, okay, and so on. So basically, this guy says entanglement cannot increase by local operations and classical communication. That's your impossibility. The same way that I took here, that it's impossible to move heat from cold to hot, would be very useful if I could do that. Then I could use uh, oceans to extract infinite amount of work from, from, from the same temperature, if you like. Here, it's going to be that entanglement um, cannot increase under what we call LOCC. So if you allow Alice and Bob to locally operate in the more general way, and you even allow them to communicate by classical means, all their outcomes, all their actions, and everything else, then these kind of operations should not increase entanglement. And the logic is that entanglement is a non-local feature of your system. And local things should not increase non-locality. That's kind of the logic. Okay? That's why when I talked about, when I talked about Gizani, it was unusual that he can locally violate Bell's inequalities without having any prior violation of Bell's inequalities. But this was, of course, only because Bell's inequalities are not a good measure of entanglement in general. So now let's assume that this is the, the second law. And what am I going to do with that? Um, what I'm going to do with that is, uh, is basically I'm going to run the cycle like that. This is going to be, this is going to be my, uh, my Carnot cycle in one direction. And now I'm going to suppose that actually I, can, I have another cycle with, which violates this. And you will see immediately the, the problem. So I'm going to start with A00 plus B11. And if you like, N copies. And I'm going to get to something like a maximally entangled state. Um, and I'm going to have something, whatever I said before. This times the amount of entanglement. Okay? That's possible. And now someone comes along and says, oh, I can do better than what you're doing. I, I really can do better. And you say, tell me what you can do, OK? And, and someone says, I can actually get something higher than that. I can start with the same state. Um, or you can say, I can start with fewer states here, n prime, which is smaller than n. And I can still end up with the same number out there. Or I can start with the same number of states and end up with something larger. It makes no difference. It's just, uh, just going to change what we have to reverse. Imagine it's like that. This would really be a direct analogy. So um, the input heats are the input states. And the output work, in a way, is how much entanglement I can get at the end here. And now what I do is I run this guy in reverse. And now what I effectively keep getting is something that can generate more and more entanglement by local operations, ad infinitum. Why? Because I start with n pairs, I have my cycle. I create n times entanglement. That's my cycle. Then I take your super efficient cycle, run it backwards, and I get more than I started with. Then I couple that back and I get even more here. I get now n prime times e, and I can get as much entanglement as I like by local operations. But I'm claiming that there is something called the second law of entanglement which says you cannot do that. Hence, you cannot be more efficient than the cycle I showed you there. It's very beautiful. Okay, it's really interesting. Just based on, again, the idea of reversibility. Uh, there is one. One, one interesting application of this that I wanted to show you, and then I think I'm going to stop. There, there is a huge number of analogies exploited in, in, in this way. Uh, and basically, like I said, from 96 onwards, the whole thing exploded, and there are really many papers. But I think the gist of the idea is really how to make the connections uh, between these two. Here is, here is something interesting. If you ask me, what can you do now with this second law of entanglement? Is there something interesting you can actually do rather than just confirming some old results? So the test of a, 
of a new idea in science is always, of course, to explain something that you didn't know before, rather than just explaining what you knew to start um, to start with. So here is a cute example I can think of, but there are many others. And the example goes like this. Let's go back to the teleportation that I explained before. So you have an entangled pair, and you have one particle here that belongs to Alice. So one and two basically are with Alice. This one is with Bob. Alice does some operations which are local on her qubits. Then she communicates to Bob, and then this guy ends up uh, in Bob's uh, possession. So that was that was basically. So this was a maximally entangled state, like zero zero plus one one, and this was some kind of state psi that Alice didn't know. It just came to her from from somewhere in the universe. Basically, or someone prepared it without telling her what uh, what they did. So what we said in the teleportation protocol is that the original has to be destroyed once it's teleported. So what ends up being the end of the teleportation protocol in the standard stuff is that 1 and 2 become entangled, but who cares, they're on Alice's side. That's because she made the measurement. And number 3 becomes the particle psi. <laughs> and here is a question that I'd like to ask you. What happened at the end of the protocol is that the entanglement between Alice and Bob has been destroyed. That's one thing we didn't mention last time. So they have one unit of entanglement, they do teleportation and they burn it. They just use this unit to fully teleport. And the question is, does it need to be the case? Can I actually keep the entanglement, teleport, and then with this entanglement at the end use it for another teleportation, and yet another teleportation, and yet another teleportation? So, is there anything obviously wrong with this idea? So basically, do I really, in the same way that I claim that you have to destroy the original, now I'm claiming that it seems that I have to use one unit of entanglement to teleport. I can't do it with half a unit, or can I? Can I do it with a quarter of a unit and keep three quarters for another three teleportations? And the answer is you cannot do it, provided that you believe in the, in the church of the second law of entanglement, okay? And here's a very simple way of seeing that. That's really beautiful. So, you know, again, I don't want to make too much fun of mathematicians. How would a mathematician try to prove this? Well, a mathematician would try to write all possible operations that a person can do, and there are continuously infinitely many of them. And then you would try to rule out each one of them uh, and rule out that there is any entanglement left. But of course, you can bring in a seal of any size here, and so you're talking about an infinite dimensional Hilbert space to start with, and there is no way you can rule all of these guys out. It's an intractable problem. That's why it's nice to have a high-level law which rules it out in the same way that uh, a second law of thermodynamics rules out certain, certain processes in nature. So how am I going to reason now? The way I reason is as follows. Suppose that you can perform the teleportation here, so this guy ends up like that. But on top of it, there is still one unit of entanglement left. Let's suppose the contrary. Exactly like every proof that we've done uh, so far. Now, imagine that my initial state was actually half of an entangled pair. This is now what's known as entanglement swapping. So rather than Alice receiving just one qubit, she still receives this one qubit, but it happens to be a state that's reduced from an overall entangled state. And in principle, you can always do that. Every state you receive can be seen as a contraction of an extended entangled state. Okay? What happens now? Well, what happens now is that when I teleport this guy to the other side, I still preserve entanglement. Okay? Because effectively, I move this guy here, but any connections that this guy had are still intact there. Because teleportation is a linear transformation. So now I've got this entanglement across, and I claim that I didn't destroy the original. I've got two units of entanglement, whereas I started with one unit of entanglement. All I did was local operations and classical communication. Hence, you should not be able to do that according to the second law. 
So now I've ruled out infinitely many P of VMs. I don't even have to discuss them by just knowing that I shouldn't be able to do certain things, like double the amount of entanglement by local operations. And actually, the structures of these two theories are really, are really very, uh, very closely related. And of course, the immediate speculation there, uh, the immediate speculation there is that when you talk about mixed states in statistical mechanics, and you talk about the entropies in statistical mechanics and the fact that if you have a closed system, the entropy cannot decrease and so on. Can it be that all of this ultimately can be phrased through entanglement simply because we know that any mixed state can be seen uh, through the extension of the higher Hilbert space? So are, are these really analogies? Or is the second law of thermodynamics the way it is because quantum mechanics is the way it is at some higher level? So this is also a very interesting question. Of course, we don't have, we don't have an answer to any of these questions. So I'm going to stop here, and what I'm going to do next is, is uh, I think this is pretty much what you can say about pure states and bipartite states. What I want to continue uh, in the second half is make mixed states out of this. That's one generalization you can do. So instead of using this state, use some kind of mixed state in general. And the second thing that we are going to go into uh, is basically to use more than, more than two subsystems. And that's really now uh, a field that's exploded because if you take large number of subsystems, then you're going effectively into the solid state and condensed matter. And that's really going to be the subject of the, of the final, you know, fourth, fourth week of the, of the course. So let's make a 10 minute break and then come back to mixed states. Uh, so what I what I what I want to what I want to really uh, talk about now is the generalizations of the. So there are many ways of talking about pure bipartite entanglement, and all of them somehow point to the same measure, and that's why we believe that this reduced entropy of either of the subsystems, which are the same, uh, is a good measure of entanglement. So either from a completely theoretical uh, perspective. Uh, where you write it as the Schmidt decomposition, trace one subsystem out, get the mixed state, take the entropy of that state and say here is entanglement. Or if you say, I don't like this, actually I want something what people call operational and we physicists love operational measures. And then you say, okay, why not then start with n pairs, locally do something and see how much maximum entanglement you can get out of it. And actually even though this looks like a completely different starting point, you of course get exactly the same measure. So all of these things nicely coincide. And this is something that actually is broken now when you talk about generalizations. So just to give you a, a, a hint, although we'll talk a bit more about it later for, uh, for more than two subsystems, the problem really ultimately is that, is that we don't have a Schmidt decomposition for them. So if you, have, if you have three, for example, qubits, uh, or three D-level systems, uh, and you're given a general state, uh, if you like, A, B, C, then, uh, then unfortunately for us, we cannot write, uh, we can really not write this as alpha N, uh, A, N, B, N, C, N. Not with the same, not with the same index N in it. Um, so this, some states, and they're known, known as the GXZ states, the Greenberger, Horn, Zeilinger states, if you like, they are like that. Uh, but they're a very special class of states. Um, and, and so just to give you an example, so basically, um, a state of this type would be a state like that. And that seems like a natural generalization uh, of, of the Bell states that we've been using before. But then someone might equally well come along and say, what about a state like that? And these are known as W states in the, in the community. So an equal, uh, doesn't even have to be an equal, basically superposition of three different uh, orthogonal states. And now is, you know, so what is this? And, and it's clearly entangled in the sense that none of the subsystems can be separated from any other subsystem in both cases. Uh, but, but you can now, but it's clearly not the same state. 
And, and if you try to somehow unitarily rotate this state into this state, you will fail by local means. So you can't, you can't move this guy from 1 to 0 and somehow uh, arrive at that state. So we know that local operations cannot make them uh, perfectly convertible into each other. Uh, and, and, and of course, this presents a, a huge problem for us, that there is no. So in a way, this W state is, is a proof, in some sense, that you don't have a Schmidt decomposition when you talk about uh, three qubits. Why is this a problem? Uh, you, you say, OK, fine, there is a problem, there is no Schmidt decomposition. But that's only a theoretical way of talking about these things. Why don't you go into your operational definition and solve this problem? Well, if I go into the operational definition, I have to identify a target state. I have to identify a state towards which I'd like all the other states to go by local operations. And this state is a maximally entangled state. And any Bell state for two qubits is a maximally entangled state, locally equivalent. Here I have a serious dilemma now. Am I going to call this guy a maximally entangled state? Or am I going to call this guy or x number of other states a maximally entangled state? So we don't have a clear definition there. And in fact, there is no answer to this. You can have a reasonable measure, which tells you that one of them is maximally entangled, and the other one is very little entangled, and then vice versa, you have another equally good measure, which does the opposite. So, so we don't know how to solve this problem. And lots of people have thought about it. So in, in that sense, um, this is even uh, less clean than what I'm going to proceed with now, where I can actually give you some concrete results and I'd like to really talk about it now. And it's a nice lesson in quantum mechanics, again, in general, not just in, in entanglement theory. So instead of talking about, uh, about uh, pure states and extending to more subsystems, I go into mixed states of, of, of two subsystems. So the question is, and I think this is something I mentioned, I mentioned before. So the sub, the sub heading of this is uh, uh, Paris Horodetsky, and you will see immediately uh, what this is um, um, criteria. Um, I I raised this issue um, before, which was if I have a set of set of all states then we know that this is a convex set in the sense that if I choose any two density matrices, any linear combination of these two density matrices is going to be within the set itself. So the set cannot be like that, because then there will be some states outside of the set. This is fully convex. Um, if you look at separable states, which is the ones that we are now trying to discriminate from entangled states. So we are quantifying entanglement by saying these states are not entangled, and everything else becomes entangled. Um, and, and these separable states we wrote down before as, as, as product states. So Alice prepares one state and Bob prepares another. And that's some kind of classical probability distribution on top of these product states. So these are the states that don't violate Bell's inequalities. You can, you can create them only by local operations. And because of the second law of entanglement, that I cannot create entanglement, a uh, more entanglement by local operations, this means that these guys are a good definition of a disentangled state. So separable and disentangled uh, are, um, are uh, completely synonymous. Now, does this solve your problem? Uh, well, it doesn't quite, because if I give you a density matrix, you have to decide whether this density matrix can be written in this form or not. And even if I give you a 4 by 4 density matrix, which is 2 qubits, it's the smallest I can, I can use to talk meaningfully about entanglement, even this was actually a very difficult problem. We have a full solution for this case, but actually it took a little bit of time to understand that. So um, ba basically, it, it took something like probably more than 15, 16 years, because the first time these guys were written down was something like late 80s, Werner. And then finally, when this criterion came out, was, was in 96, 97. So it took a long time of people thinking uh, about it. Um, so this set, incidentally, is also convex. 
So you know, let's imagine that this guy is your separable. You know, here is within this boundary we have row separable states. And the question is, can I, can I, can I, you know, how can I talk about discriminating entangled states from separable states? And and what I said last time, and I will actually continue, continue with that. Um, is, is basically all this boils down to is you're given one state and you want to know whether this state belongs to this set or not. And I call this uh, uh, the Han Banach theorem, which says that if the state is outside of the convex set, then you can always find um, a plane such that the state is on one side of the plane and your um, convex set is on the other side of the plane. You see, it's crucial that this set is convex. If it's concave, and if I have a point here, I cannot draw a line. I mean, I have to separate them somehow, but this is no longer a plane or a line. So it's, it's crucial, we, we got lucky in some sense, if you like, that this set is a convex set. If, when you talk about this code, um, this is a comment that only makes sense to you if it makes sense to you in some sense, if you know about it already. So it's a little bit of a pointless comment. But when you try to zoom in and study different types of correlations, you'll be encountering structures that are no longer convex. And somehow it's very difficult to translate these statements into, into those structures. I want to now stop here and tell you a very beautiful logic. So I want to explain the Paris side of things, because the Horodetsky will take another 35 minutes, okay? Effectively to explain to you how they did it. And it's a really interesting story. It's a beautiful story. It's a human story like any other story. I'm starting to sound like Charles Dickens or someone like that. So it's just like any other story, okay? Christmas Carol or whatever else you like. And, and you know, this is something that people don't realize. And it's a huge advantage for me to have been there when these things were happening. Because it's so nice to see how these guys came up in real time. When you read their paper, it really looks like black magic. You think, how the hell did they think about this? But actually, if you sit and have a pint of beer with Michal Korodetsky, then it all becomes nice and human. And it's lots of, actually, random accidents that somehow led them. I mean, they're great guys. But still, randomness counts quite a lot in all of our lives. And this is something that no one ever teaches you when you read textbooks. And it's really nice to be there and, and see textbooks getting written in front of your eyes, in some sense. So if someone said, you've achieved fame if your name appears in the undergraduate textbook. And I think they are going towards this kind of fame, I would say, for that. Now, what did Paris do? Paris was much less mathematical. And, and he, had a, he had a very beautiful way of talking about this. So he said, he said, okay, I'd like to discriminate this guy from this guy. And, and he now really starts thinking physically about it. He says, imagine that these guys are really on two different planets, our usual way of thinking about two subsystems. You know, here I have Rho A and Bob is somewhere on Mars with his system, or in another galaxy or whatever you like. Okay, so here is row A, here is row B. And now a general density matrix of a qubit has diagonal elements and off diagonal elements. So imagine, for example, that they, this guy and this guy have some kind of spin half system processing. You know, I've got two states and I've got some frequency. Let, let, I'm trying to make it as physical as possible to convey to you how this guy thought. It's a very creative time. So they have some kind of systems there. And if you write down the density matrix, so if I divide it by root 2 and normalize it properly, what I will get is a density matrix that looks like one half, one, so there is one half in front of the whole thing, I suppose. Uh, one, then you've got e to the i omega t, e to the minus i omega t, and one. And the same for this guy, okay? 1, 1, e to the i omega t, e to the minus i omega t. And now Paris says, hey, why do people in another galaxy have to define complex numbers in the same way that we have to define them here on Earth? Maybe for this guy on Earth, i is equal to square root of minus 1, 
but maybe these guys are using the conjugate of that guy. And the conjugate is, of course, <coughs> minus this guy. Maybe they're thinking minus square root of minus 1. I mean, why not? What difference does that make? What do I know what aliens are doing with <coughs> complex numbers? Okay. Interestingly enough, if you do that and you send i into minus i, all you do is change this minus sign into plus sign and this plus sign into minus sign. But the state is still one and the same state in many ways. It's still a valid physical density matrix. You can check that this is, um, that this is emission. It's positive and it has a unit trace, 1 plus 1 divided by 2. No change there. So I on Earth should not be able to detect whether aliens are calling the i root of minus 1 or, or minus root of minus 1. Okay, see how interesting this is, this thing. And therefore he says, any state of this type, so not only when I have one density here, one density here, but any convex combination of density matrices like that, I should be able to do to each density matrix this transformation. That's known as partial transposition. Partial because I'm not doing it on Earth. I'm doing it on Mars only. And transposition is because I'm effectively exchanging the off diagonal element. So whenever I do a partial transposition, I still get another allowed physical state. And somehow the whole thing makes complete sense. So Perez says, if we really don't share any entanglement, then I have the complete freedom to do that, and I will still get a valid physical state. So the statement is that um, CP, so this guy, this guy, tensor product, something that has been transposed, um, is another density matrix. Um, so this is uh, emission. Uh, and positive, and unit trace if you are. So somehow, by thinking in, a, in, in this physical way, he arrives at a property that these guys have, which is that they don't change their, their physics, if you like, under transposition of either one of them. You can run the same story now, put the transposition here, but not here, and we'll get the same thing. And the statement now is, is this true for any other state? Is it true for entangled states? And the difficult bit is to prove that this is not true at all for entangled states. Okay? Um, so how do I know that? Perez didn't know that, and hence Korodetsky. So Perez just showed it in one direction, which is the direction that I, the easy direction, if you like. I mean, it still took someone of that caliber to come up with a, with a, with a smart idea. But basically, he started with a state that's not entangled, he did a partial transposition, and he still clearly gets another disentangled state. And then he shows that for some entangled states, this is no longer true. And now this is going to teach us quite a lot about the completely positive operations, because this operation is not a completely positive one, it's only a positive one. So it only makes sense it's only physical on the reduction on which it operates, but when you look at it from a larger perspective, it gives you something that's not a physical state if you start with an entangled state, and that's actually the whole point. And then I want to show you how this was shown in the other direction. So I'd like to show that anything that's entangled gives you a negative density matrix here. So if I really started from, this is only true for two qubits, and uh, a cubic and a q trip if you like. I'll talk about that as well. But basically, uh, if this is entangled to show that you um, negative state, what this means is a state with a negative probability, negative eigenvalue, so, so it can't happen. To show that this goes in this direction as well um, is, is, is not easy at all. So basically, this was Perez's paper, the first one which came out, and it said, Partial transposition seems to do the, the job for me. So let me, let me actually give you the example that he had, uh, and, then, and then I will actually I will, I will proceed to, to argue much more generally, and I think I'll have enough time to almost finish 
uh, we did today. So basically, what he said is imagine a maximally entangled state. So this is the whole point, that something that appears to be a, an allowed physical operation, because it converts a density matrix into another density matrix. When you look at this matrix as part of a larger state, then the larger state goes nuts, in some sense, if this is a transposition. So that's not something you can do in nature, transposition. In fact, you can think of this not just as i going to minus i, but you can think of it as time going to minus time. And this is this famous time reversal operation. It's not a unitary transformation. It's an anti-unit. It can't be done as far as we understand, according to our current knowledge of the way the world works. So how did Paris show that something funny is going to happen to the state? He said, let's write this as a density matrix. And without boring you too much, basically there are four entries. So if you really normalize this properly, then you will have one half here, nothing in this part, one half here. So basically the only elements existing uh, are 0, 0 with 0, 0, and 0, 0 with 1, 1, and the conjugate, and that's it. So the rest of these guys are, are not there, if you like, and then you've got a half and a half. This is your density matrix as a, uh, written as an operator. And what does a partial transposition mean? The partial transposition means I'm going to swap zeros and ones, but I'm only going to do that for the second system. Full transposition would mean exchange all of these guys. But partial transposition means exchange these two. I'm just going to write it down because I know what it means, but you can, you can check what this means. So I'm not exchanging all the off diagonals with all the other off diagonals. I'm only exchanging the ones corresponding to the swap of the second qubit in this. Could be the first. It's going to give you the same thing. So, so the state, when you transpose B only, or A, is going to look like a half. The rest are zeros now because I swapped zero and a half. I've got zero, zero, one half, zero, zero, one half, zero, zero and this. And is this an allowed physical state? So you see, something that makes sense for a subsystem may not make sense to, for the rest of the universe. That's why we insist on complete positivity. Transposition is not a complete, it's just positive on its own domain, but not complete. Complete means engage the rest of the universe, as I'm doing here, I'm engaging the other qubit. And all you need to do, so this, this is a, these two are positive numbers, but this is, a, you know, you just have to diagonalize this matrix. And of course, you will get plus a half and a minus a half as the eigenvalues. And there will be a minus one half eigenvalue. So if you look at, if you look at E1, E plus minus, it will be plus minus a half. And the fact that there is a minus half there means that, that I cannot interpret this properly because I'm getting a negative probability for one of the states. The rest is fine in the sense that it's still a Hermitian matrix and it's still trace preserving because half plus a half plus a half is three halves minus a half is one. I've conserved probability. The only thing that this violates is the fact that we believe that probabilities should be positive. Is a very cute paper by Feynman, which argues that actually if you, if you get rid of this prejudice that the probabilities should be positive, then you can explain entanglement in this way. It's a little bit like negative Wigner function. You know, if you accept that you can have negative density of probability, then what's the problem? You've got hidden variables. They're a bit funny, but they are hidden variables. So you see, now you're learning that there are other things we can give up. Bell, when he was constructing the theorem, had implicitly assumed that there are probabilities which are frequencies. And when you talk about frequencies, there are ratios of two real or whatever uh, natural numbers, and they, they've got to be positive. But if you allow negative probability, whatever that means, so imagine you have a measurement apparatus where your pointer moves in one direction to show you the probability between 0 and 1, and suddenly you do the experiment and the pointer goes in the other direction. Negative probability. I mean, we physicists in theory can interpret anything 
uh, if you really push as hard. If you like this interpretation, and I claim that you have no problem with quantum mechanics, it's the same as classical physics. You just happen to have negative probabilities. Well, just. <laughs> okay, so, so basically, that's exactly what happens here. It's something that makes sense on one subsystem, like, uh, like to transpose its elements. Suddenly, when you look at this subsystem as part of the universe, loses this, and actually the, the universe now itself no longer uh, makes any sense. Um, one of the crit so now you say, great, I've got a way of, uh, I haven't co completely convinced you that this is the way it is. I, I, I won't try to do that now. But basically now you say, great, I've got a nice way of discriminating what's separable and what's not separable. You give me a state, I implement partial transposition, whoops, I can't implement partial transposition. This is not an operational way of testing entanglement. You can't do it. That's the whole point. You're giving something that makes no sense. You can do it on paper, but you can't do that in reality. Unless you can reverse time or, or do some other things. So now, that's why I want to continue with the second part in a way to show you how this becomes a little bit more natural than that. So I'm going to stop the story here. Paris's co conjecture is that it goes in both directions. Separable states stay separable under partial transposition, but entangled states always lead to negative probability. Okay? And now, uh, enter, enter the Horodetsky family. Uh, so what did they do? They basically, um, they, they knew about, about this result that I mentioned last time, that if you have a point outside of a convex set, then you can always find a line, I'll translate this into geometry in a minute, you can always find a line such that the point is on one side of that line and the set is on the other side of that line, or the plane if you're thinking. This is of course a 15 dimensional space for two qubits. Um, and, and so it's, it's really it's difficult to visualize. So think of this, so how would you, how would you actually translate this into, into, into linear algebra? And that's the key now. Think of it really as, as, as vectors. Think of this plane or line defined by a vector that's basically orthogonal to the line itself. That's how we define a plane. We say any line that's orthogonal to my line lies in the plane. And it's enough to find two such lines that are not the same and they define the plane uniquely. So here is a vector, and anything inside here, on this line, call it vector L if you like, is going to be orthogonal to the, to the V vector. So again, in our notation, or whichever notation, these guys are going to give you zero. That's my definition of the plane. Now notice, notice what's going to happen with the, with, the two different, with the two different states. What I now want to calculate is what is the inner product between the, the plane vector V and the vector connecting the plane and the separable uh, and the entangled state. Let's call this vector E. Okay? Well, I don't know, but it will not be zero. It will be some positive number. So the inner product of, uh, let me clearly label this as L, of V and E is going to be some positive number, which you know is related to the angle between these two, of course. But what about disentangled states? What about any vector going to the set on the other side? Okay, let's call this D. The inner product of V and D is going to be a negative number. That's what it means geometrically to lie on the other side of the plane. Okay, because the angle that it makes is bigger than pi by 2. And that's it. I have to find something which makes a positive angle with my, with my entangled state, while at the same time it always makes negative angles with separable states. And that's how I know that my guy is entangled. If I can never find that, that means that my guy is also on the other side and belonging to the separable states. Okay? So that's, that's the Han Banach 
the, the, the very difficult theorem I mentioned from uh, functional analysis translated into common geometrical language. And once I told you the inner products, you know what the inner product is in quantum mechanics. It's trace of an operator V. Let me stick as closely as possible to the notation and another operator L. The way we do inner product in quantum mechanics, in the most general sense of the Born postulate, is just multiply two operators. Think of it as, as one is a Hermitian operator, your observable, think of it as your density matrix, if you like, never mind. And the trace of that is effectively your inner product, how close to each other they are. So here is a translation of this statement. Sigma AB is entangled if and only if, this is this double if that goes in both directions, in this direction as well as in the opposite direction, if you like, which is the, the difficult one I said to prove. The statement is that this is entangled if and only if I can find, um, I can find some operator V, but now I'm going to call it W for entanglement weakness. So if there exists, you see how mathematical I've become. Um, if there exists an operator W um, such that the trace of W times your state AB is positive, in direct analogy, that means your state is on one side of the operator. So this line now becomes your Hermitian operator. While at the same time, the trace of your witness with any separable state, any row a, B, Z is negative. Okay? That's now the Han banner. You don't have to prove this because you open a book on functional analysis, now analysis page 175, and there is a theorem called Han banner theorem. So, so that's it. Because I, I've showed you that I have convex sets, I can translate now uh, normal two-dimensional geometry into, into operators. And now I've got, a, I've, got a nice, I've got a nice way of talking about this. Um, so in both directions, it's true because if I cannot find a plane like that, according to Han Banach, the only way is that this point is inside the set. That's why I cannot find that. As soon as this guy is out, there is a plane that does the job for me. Okay, so that's, that's where you get uh, both directions. And now you say, that's a great theorem. Hey, how do I do this in the lab? That's another question, and I think we'll talk about it next week. It's not, it's not that easy to, to convert this. But let me, let me say what, um, what I can say about it. Um, this, this is Kant Banach. Here is partial transposition. What's the connection? Now I've given you two ways of doing that. But I'm only following this guy to show you that partial transposition in a way goes in both directions. And now I think I will summarize the story because otherwise I will, I will basically uh, completely kill you on Monday night. Um, and I have something like 10 minutes to summarize it. Uh, and then we will start with that tomorrow again. So basically, here is how this goes now. Uh, and this is really the difficult part. This is, like I said, a Han Banach theorem. You don't have to. You don't have to do anything to, to recognize that. You only have to recognize the structure of, of states. Now, um, this W is just a Hermitian operator, and that's where the physics comes in. The ingenuity of an experimental physicist is to find the witness, which is always negative. By the way, these signs are irrelevant, because I can always put a minus sign in front and reverse these guys. So it doesn't really matter. You can put any constant here if you like. And the way that the sensor so can always move W into minus W and it's still a Hermitian operator, like inverting the spectrum of your Hamiltonian or whatever else. Um, so, so basically, the trick is to find an operator which I can measure, in other words, a Hermitian operator, which behaves differently on separable states to entangled states. And that's how I know that the state I have is entangled, because no separable state can do what this guy does. It's a very physical way of stating that. But of course, what's the connection with the partial transposition? And that's what I'm trying to, to get to now. And the connection is interesting. And it goes 
via, via another statement, uh, which is called by a strange name, um, Yamilkovsky isomorphism. And yes, you guessed it. Yamilkovsky's office number is 15 and Horodetsky 14. They sit next to each other, which is why they knew about Yamilkovsky. That was the uh, accident of the number one. Because if that didn't happen, probably they would never be thinking along these lines. So you, you need some kind of inputs like that. <laughs> um, what did this guy do? This guy did something. Uh, which is interesting, but only interesting from our perspective. I have no idea why he did it from his own perspective. It's completely useless. I mean, he was, of course, a mathematician. So I cannot ask why did he do it, you know? Um, uh, basically, you know, there's a famous poem going, uh, um, ours not to reason why, ours but to do and die. This was the Lord Tennyson talking about a battle, a famous battle, actually, in English history. Where, where they charged in the wrong direction, actually. And there was a, a huge bloodbath where lots of, lots of people died. So, and, and he was, of course, describing soldiers who were there to die and not to reason why. And like I said, I think you can say similar things about engineers and mathematicians. But of course, we're physicists here and we have to reason why. Um, I think, Marcelo, you entered at the wrong point. This is the first joke about mathematicians. So, uh, and you're not doing well. In comparing to engineers. <laughs> That's too much, sorry. Um, it's below the belt. It's, a it's below the belt. <laughs> okay, so what did Yanukovsky do? He said basically any Hermitian operator, I'll show you that as well, actually, it's very simple. Um, any Hermitian operator, I can write as identity on Alice. This is going to be a Hermitian operator on two subsystems because I need it. I need to measure a bipartite state, so this always acts on both A and B, if you like. And something that's a positive, but not completely positive, positive map on Bob. And if you apply this transformation onto a maximally entangled state here, so state like 0, 0 plus 1, 1 over root 2. In higher dimensions, it's still true. You can add 2, 2, 3, 3, whatever is the maximum entangled equivalent. So what this says is, if I operate on the second subsystem and not on the first, then I can always look at this as a Hermitian operator on both of these guys. I mean, What's, what's the intuition? Imagine that this was a completely a physical operation, a measurement. It's not a measurement. This is not possible to do in general because it's not completely. But imagine it is completely positive. That's a little bit like tracing the second system out. What are you going to get on the first system? You will get some kind of physical state. And you can see that when you combine the first and the second, you will get two density matrices. The only thing I'm telling you now is that this is not completely positive, which means that the resulting operator could have negative eigenvalues. But so what? I'm calling it Hermitian. I'm not calling it a density matrix. And a general Hermitian operator can have negative, <coughs> uh, negative eigenvalues. So in fact, you, know, you can do exactly what I've been doing here. And here is one beautiful example of that. Think of this lambda as the trans transposition. Start with a maximum entangled state, transpose it, and I'm getting a Hermitian operator here. It's, it's got a negative eigenvalue. It's not a density matrix, but it is a Hermitian operator. It's a good observable. You can measure it in the lab. That's what this says. Nothing more and nothing less. Okay. So once I've shown you that you can measure entanglements, uh, entanglement with a Hermitian operator, Yamilkovsky says you can use positive maps. You don't have to use Hermitian operators. Why? Because I've got my own isomorphism. And I haven't got a clue what to do with it. But you do maybe. Okay? So he's got an isomorphism there. One final piece. 
is that when you talk about qubits, and this is why this only works for a small number of dimensions. This is the last statement I will make, and then I will stop, and then, um, and then we continue tomorrow. A positive transformation, when you are in low dimensions, can be written in a very convenient way. In general, we have no idea how to write it. That's another open problem. But you can write it as something that's completely positive plus another completely positive map times transposition. And that's for the first time now when you see transposition enter. Okay? So what Yanukovsky says, if you phrase your entanglement witness with uh, Hermitian operators, you might as well use positive maps. But every positive map can be written as a physical operation, which you don't care about because it's not going to give you any negative probabilities. Another physical, which also doesn't give you anything funny. And the only guy that has the chance of giving a negative eigenvalue is this guy. And so that's why you actually test everything with a, with a transposition. So all you need to do is look at this formula here positive or negative, and instead of W, you substitute this kind of, so basically, look at the statement trace of W sigma AB. According to Yamulkowski, this is the same as trace of identity cross lambda, maximally entangled state, let's call it phi plus, I'm going to get lazy and lazy now, sigma AB. So this guy is nothing but the W. Okay. And now I can reshuffle these guys around because I'm under the partial turn, I'm under the trace. So I can reshuffle this operation not to act on this density matrix but shift it around to act on this guy. And then I've got these guys, and I said that when you have something like this and you take the trace, what you get is something like that, outer product into inner product. And if I jump through one or two lines like that, what you get is really phi plus uh, one cross this lambda, if you like, acting on sigma a b phi plus. Okay? So the state, you can do the same now with a separable state, row separable. So the statement now says is that the fact that the witness is going to be positive for entangled states but negative for separable states means that if you apply a positive map, but I've argued here that instead of lambda you can just use the transposition because it's equivalent, the other two are not going to change anything. <coughs> if you use the transposition on B, that's going to give you something positive, whereas if you act on the separable state, that's going to give you something negative. QED. That's the statement there now, in both directions. So basically this says that, that your partial transposition is bound to give you something negative on a separable state. It's just got to be. Why? Because partial transposition is up to completely positive maps the only positive map that you can do when you talk about qubits. There are no other maps of that type. So this isomorphism combined with this kind of decomposition, I believe that a guy called Choi